So my name is Kerry Hallard and I'm the Chief Exec of the Global Sourcing Association and I'm joined today by longtime GSA Council member, now advisor, Alistair. Hi everybody. You introduce yourself. Hi everybody. Yes, I'm Alistair and uh, I guess from a service provider stance, I've had uh, 25 plus years, mostly in the BPO industry, so I can understand the business side of things, but I've, I've migrated and uh, re-educated myself over the last uh, year or so into the ESG space and trying to blend those together. So I'm sort of uh, feeling I'm becoming an expert in the, the business process that surrounds all things ESG and the processes and spending most of my time involved in uh, ESG uh, assessments and reporting. OK, thank you. And then we've got two um, partners um, that have really helped us make this happen. So my console is one of those and they'll be doing a bit of a demo. So, um, yeah, Naranjan, I think, is going to be doing the presentation. Mr. Press Naranjan. He's just gone outside too. Excellent. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it relevant to the presentation straight away? No, it's no. fine. No, no, that's all good. And then we've got Terry Wolby, who's Chief Exec of Open Dialogue. And um, Terry, please do introduce yourself very briefly. Hi, uh, uh, Terry Wilby. Uh, I'm Chief Executive of Open Dialogue, which is the technology that has helped to create the digital packet for ESG. That's a conversational AI platform. Um, and I'm a long term associate council member of the GSA. <clears throat> Excellent. Right. So everybody knows this session is being recorded. We do want to use it for marketing purposes. Um, what we are proposing is if there are any questions from um, from the floor, um, hold the questions and, until um, we go into Q&A. If there are any questions on the hybrid platform, please feel free to put the questions in chat or when we open up for questions, please put your digital hands up and we'll definitely come and take all questions. OK, right. So I'm really hoping this technology works. I can't see the PowerPoint on my deck, so I'm just pressing and praying that when I press page down, the presentation works for me. Doesn't. Excellent. Right. Page down here. Hmm. Any suggestions? <laughs> um, Yes, I seem to have lost my um, whatever. Right. Go on, and Rob, your your tech support to be able to get this sorted. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, that's your introduction. She said it again. What do I press this one? OK, excellent. We're in business, so. So, yes, so this um, this program has been 18 months in the making. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a backdrop to it, I mean, everybody knows that ESG is such a big topic on the corporate boardroom agendas these days. And what we were witnessing as the, the Global Sourcing Association is that um, all of our buy side members were scrabbling around trying to write questionnaires and work out what questions they needed to ask to understand what the service and what the ESG performance was of predominantly their tier one, but also tier two service providers. So they were sort of like scratching their heads trying to to find and write the right questionnaire. Simultaneously, all of our service provider members were saying, oh my gosh, if I receive one more ESG um, questionnaire, I think I might combust because every single questionnaire they were receiving was different. And even if some of the questions were, say, were the same, the metrics they were being asked to report on was different. So it felt like there was a bit of a sort of like minefield going on out there. Um, and the GSA is, is, is massively behind the standardization revolution at the end of the day. We really do believe in collaborating and sharing to make everything a little bit easier for our, our membership in the community. So we took it upon ourselves to um, to write um, and pull together what we think, what we thought and what we think is the right ESG um, questionnaire for the industry. So um, lots and lots of organisations helped us and I would like to give thanks to those. It's a page down when you touch it, when I touch it, it doesn't like to do it. Just sit there, won't you? Just 
<laughs> so yes, lots of big buy side brands shared the questionnaires that they were actually asking and the disparity across those questionnaires was massive. So um, some questionnaires actually fitted on one page of A4. Others were sheets upon sheets of Excel spreadsheets, um, all asking for, for different information. So what we've done is we've consolidated that question set. We've also gone out to market and looked at additional questions that we think needed to be um, pulled in. So all of these people here have helped us in some way or another. So huge thanks to all of those organisations for, for, for doing that. So the, the result of it is that we now have a very in-depth questionnaire. Alistair, how many questions do we have in it? It's yeah, 214. 214 uh, questions. I think, and I think the interesting thing is that, you know, when you look at all of the assessments out there and available, there is a difference. I know we have a, a slide coming up about that, but, you know, it's, it's important to understand that if you are a service provider and you're dipping your toes or you're going down the path to implement an ESG uh, culture, then you are going to need a relatively comprehensive set of questions. You, there are areas of the business you, you need to reach into and a large percentage of the things that are in the ESG requirement, which is really about policies and procedures, are things that you do in your business anyway. So there's a massive amount of coalescence into what is framed as ESG. So I've always been wanting to understand, to put things into simple terms because it was awfully complex at the start. Thank you. Yes. So, um, so what we thank you. Yes. <laughs> so what what we've done is create this this questionnaire, and our intent is very much that we understand how well service providers are performing across the length and breadth of the industry. You know, the intent is for the buyers to invite their service providers to fill in the questionnaire. They fill in the questionnaire once, the GSA becomes the repository and holds the results of the performance of every service provider. Um, the idea is that we then create a benchmark so we know who's performing really well in the industry and who is needing a little bit of help to address some, some areas. Now, it's not going to be a name and shame index. It will never take off if it becomes a name and shame index. It's very much for buyers to come to us directly and ask for their service providers to fill in the report, but to know that then how well their service provider is performing against the other service providers that they're working with and against the industry as a whole. And the intent also is that we, uh, as the GSA, will have a really strong understanding of trends and changes over time as to how well our industry is performing, where they need additional help, where the weaknesses are, where the strengths are, and that we will share more and more information so that the industry as a whole improves across the ESG agenda. That is the absolute intent. intent. Now, I'm a firm believer that um, our industry already performs really well across the ESG agenda. I mean, if you, you think about our industry, um, we're a people industry. You know, I think our environmental footprint is is significantly better than like a manufacturing industry or, you know, chemicals industry. Um, obviously, AI is having an impact in the consumption of um, um, of, of energy at the moment, but on the whole, I think we're environmentally clean industry. Um, I think we're very good at governance. The sourcing, outsourcing industry has been built on good governance at the end of the day. So um, I, I think that we are going to be able to also use this index that are actually positioning the technology and business services industry of being an industry at the avant-garde of the ESG agenda, an industry for, for good at the end of the day. So what we've done in the in the asking of the questions, but much more in the ranking of the results of the questionnaire, is um, we have got a different weighting in it. So 20% of all of the marks are attributed to environmental factors. 20% of the marks are attributed to governance, but 60% of our framework and weighting is on social. And that goes back to the fact that we are a people industry. We really need to be focusing so, so, so much on those social aspects. So um, the questionnaire is written from a services industry perspective and weighted from a services industry perspective. So I think one of the 
the main questions we've been asked in the evolution, Alistair, is, you know, what really is different about what you're doing? Why do we need uh, a different index? Why do we need GSA's SPSI when there are obviously lots of other players out there? So if you'd like to take this one. Yeah, I think it's um, really important to understand that that this is a, a by the industry for the industry initiative. So it's it's taking counsel from within the industry um, and those industry bodies who build this. So the first thing is looking at that difference in weighting that says the social sustainability is absolutely key to the business and to the industry. Uh, and when you pull out the results, you can still be looking at your environmental and your governance issues, but it's really important to look at that. So what we see over time um, with the GSA and, and other partners is that this will be an iterative growth process. So we've taken the counsel of a great many companies, as you can see, which are relevant to the industry, valued by the industry. And it's about saying that the, the ability is inside of that assessment to be able to respect any and all standards that are applicable. And so, you know, running those forward is really important. I covered the previous point that says it may look like a, a pretty big uh, assessment of 214 questions, but the way we've structured it is that we, we use an email based background, which allows you to receive and you'll see this shortly. Kerry will show up where uh, we have the five business pillars that the, the assessment questions go to. So it, it doesn't just go to the what is often the case, the sustainability office or someone who's been given the task of looking at this ESG thing. It is actually designed so that you then nominate who are the people in your business that are the most qualified. So it goes to HR, IT, compliance. Uh, it goes through the five different areas that you would be running the business. So I think it's, you know, the, the key is that it's it's an assessment that that looks at these areas. And I think over the next coming years, it will grow and change into those things that are relevant. So those things that are relevant for the industry to change are things that come from the voice of the industry, both on the buy side and the sell side. Because one thing I learned from, from ADEC a long time ago is, is the importance of the, the supply chain, the importance of understanding end to end. And uh, you know, having met them 25 years ago when they were doing uh, back office processing for carbon accounting, you know, the little that I know that in the future would be important to understand, but understand how that fits inside of this industry. And so the peculiarities of the uh, technology and business services is embedded in this. Thank you. Right, do you want to yes. through the process? So um, it's not a, a complicated process. I've always talked about, I've already talked about the defining the function owners. So there is one place to go right now, which is to the GSA which is to go in and register. At that point of registration, you will give a bit of detail about your company, the size of your company, and more importantly, the scope of the assessment. So an assessment can be done by, by site, by country, by region, by group, um, and that defines the way that you will answer. But it also defines the way that your buyers may be asking you to provide the information. So if they're buying from an EMEA region, for example, they may want the survey to be focused on the EMEA region, or it might be South Africa, it might be Poland. So you go through and you register. At this point, the person who is making the registration becomes the owner of the assessment, and that owner receives an introduction which gives some good guide points into the sort of things they should prepare before they go about setting out the survey response. And included in that are the definition of those five function owners. Those five function owners then receive a survey relevant, so they'll have a breakdown of those questions, um, different numbers. I think the largest one is the HR uh, section, and there's no uh, mystery there in that it's re representing 60% of the score. This, it is distributed. Uh, people go about doing that. They use the um, the uh, chatbot or the digital assistant. Um, that goes with GSA, and we'll show that shortly um, to assist in the process because we don't want to get to a point where people get partway through answering a survey and they get stuck and then you make a case and they find they need a document. There's a lot of reasons why people would all of a sudden stall and you've got to chase. So we want it to be an efficient, thorough process. And I think we've built all of those elements in there. The owner can always look at the completion by each of the five different areas and, and chase and follow up. So you've got to a uh, bit of a project management sort of piece in that. The survey is completed, it's scored automatically with uh, the
the ratings and the weightings, um, and then an ESG maturity report uh, is then produced, which is something that um, if, if you are assisting your buy side to do that, then you'll be you'll be sending that report uh, in so that people can then go about matching uh, their various service providers. Thank you. So um, as Alistair just mentioned, we do actually have um, a digital companion that sits alongside um, um, the, the survey to really help ensure um, two things. One, that whoever's responding to the survey um, fills it out. We don't lose them on the journey. You know, they've got all the information they need at hand to help them understand. You know, the, the language set around ESG at the moment is is constantly growing. There's new acronyms. It's 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 a minefield out there. So we did feel that it was really important to try and help guide um, whoever's filling in the survey to understand um, what the questions are that we were asking of them. So, um, so Terry, do you want to give a little bit of an intro to? Um, what uh, you're yeah, doing? sure. So, um, I guess a bit of context. Open Dialogue are an early stage technology business. We launched the business in uh, May 2022. The technology itself was developed over the previous five years by a group of experts in conversational AI, backwing chatbots, and conversational AI it wasn't a cool thing. Um, and now, of course, it is. So everybody's interested, but that comes with a, a health warning in terms of what's available and how you how you take advantage of it. So, um, in in developing the uh, open dialogue platform, what we recognise is the huge potential of, of conversational experience to change the way people interact with technology. And over time, we actually see that replacing pretty much everything you do, both in the home and in the workplace, uh, from filling in forms and uh, and providing information in a structured way to being a much more conversational interaction. It's just the way the world is going to change, we believe. Um, and that will manifest itself in, in ways such as nine out of 10 customer service engagements will be automated through conversational experience, not through a person. That's going to completely change the industry that um, that we all work in and that we're, that we're talking about. Um, uh, I think, you know, there was a lot of scepticism historically about that, but I think this whole advent of chat GPT and people seeing generative AI and what, what it can do has really changed uh, the landscape of that. But as I said, it comes with a health point. And the really important thing is that when you do use tools like uh, generative AI and language models, that you do so in a way that is safe, is trustworthy, is consistent, is auditable and is explainable. Uh, those those last two are some of the big challenges with a lot of technology that's in this that's in this space. Can can, can it be audited and can it can you explain what it did? And when does that matter? That particularly matters if you're doing anything that is in a regulated market, regulated industry, and something that has meaning beyond the simple purchase of a product, for example, from a retailer's website. Um, and while today uh, ESG uh, me measurement and reporting is not a regulated industry. It's coming. I was actually going to touch on this a little bit later, but it is coming. And so it was important in thinking about how do we help people on this journey to think about how do we do so in a world that's, that's regulated and compliant. Um, and, and I guess the digital assistant is a, is, is, is a first step to having a conversation experience to support this ESG, uh, this ESG journey. And the idea is it's there as an assistant to help not lose people on the way. As Kerry mentioned, the terminology of, of ESG is complex, is not well understood, is uh, it's difficult and um, one of the challenges with any provision of information into a survey, into an assessment, um, is not losing people on the journey because they get stuck, they don't have an answer, they get interrupted, they don't know what something means, they don't have the information to hand. So the idea is to, to provide an assistant that helps improve completion rates um, of what can be quite a complex journey by helping them, advising them, guiding them, answering questions, holding their hand all the way through. So um, that's the uh, the digital uh, companion, uh, and it is available on the GSA's website. I think completely free. Yeah, as of tomorrow, as of tomorrow, as of tomorrow. So please do uh, go play with it. I'm sure over time there will be things that we find we can improve. That's um, you know a, a, a chatbot's first day on the job is its worst day on the job. They do improve over time. Uh, this particular assistant has been trained on a on a a mixture of large language model generative data, but also some learned information from um, some of the key uh, measured and audited sources of information that uh, the process and uh, and, and Kerry's already been people have helped inform that journey of educating the assistant. But um, but over time there will be improvements that we can make to it as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. We'll do a quick demo of it in a minute as well. Yeah, I think we've learned a lot working with Open Dialog and the, you know, the superb technology they use. But the most important thing, what Terry said was, you know, safety and, and this is a curated environment so that whether it's assisting you in anything you're looking at on the GSA website and any of the information you want, equally you're able to use the same uh, the same bot and technology in answering the assessment. Um, and so it's it's more about not needing to go elsewhere to find the information, anything about GSA or anything about sustainability. Um, and, and that curation is really important that you do have that safe space and you don't need to go elsewhere. So, right, so I think we're going to give you a quick look at the, the process um, and questions in a bit more detail now. So, is this an imagine? Are you talking this one? Through? I'll talk this one through. Okay. You get bored with my voice still today. Um, as as I looked at the at the slide process, when you are uh, firstly subscribing and you are the project owner of the process, you will receive an email which has a, a click through, which says after you've already had an email which has explained to you the process. If you click on that, Kerry, we should if it's the right link, then it, what it should be showing us is both the. Um, I think you have to touch the. The you have you'll see there that the the survey has the I need Rob. Yes, the click here was. Uh, what what this next screen shows are the five the request for the details of the five owners of the five sections of the response. So you're putting in their their name, their email address, and contact details. And that what that does is then generates the subsequent five emails. So you'll see the chatbot on the right, but we can shut that one down just because we'll demonstrate it on the next slide. Uh, this is the slide which looks at those areas. So you'll see their compliance. So who is the person responsible for the compliance questions and what is their email address? That's all you have to do. Go through, do that five as the owner of the response, send that off and those five people will be then getting an explanation email as well as their own link, which will look like Abracadabra. So what you're looking at here is the response. This is this is part of the HR set of questions, and you'll see there that it, there are sub headings. This is um, training and career management, for example. You see the chatbots available on the right. So with every question in the survey, you get uh, two, two icons with the question. One of them, if uh, Kerry hovers over the I button while she has a drink of tea, um, you get a tooltip, which is which is really just giving an explanation of um, sharing. Oh, that's not sharing. It's not sharing, but what it typically will do is just give you a short description of what is this question really asking you. Uh, you then go and you can select on the right hand side and select your answer to the question. Does your organization blah, blah, blah? Yes, no. There are different sorts of questions. There are numerical questions. There are yes, no questions. There are questions that can ask you to, to add descriptions of things. And there is also a copy button with each question. Did you beat me to it? I did, sorry. OK, so you click the little copy button. It'll take uh, the question that you're being asked. If you'd like a little bit more detail on it, then you just push the copy button, paste it into the pot, and it will give you uh, a suggested uh, explanation of what you're looking for. And Kerry will now just do a freestyle query into the um, digital assistant. Right, so what questions? Anybody got a question they would like to ask? I'm just going to put in what is scope three. Um, but it's never seen that before. <laughs> there we go. So it's going through and, and it's just allowing people who might find that there's terminology that's different. There are things that they're they're not particularly sure of. Um, whilst Terry writes that, uh, Kerry, sorry, the uh, you'll also notice up the top left there is a there is a bar which is um, at the moment doesn't have a number in it, but that that is the progress of that uh, section. So that will reduce from 100% once somebody has submitted the answers to the questions. Obviously, nothing is there. And inside of that white bar will be 64% or 72%. So um, we'll talk a little bit about our Pioneer partner and some of the very excellent suggestions they've had um, on the back of four or five years of doing other surveys and, and other assessments. And so we've incorporated into this. And I think a lot of this stuff is is, is kind of leading edge. And as Terry said, it's. It's about making sure that people can work their way through and complete this 
The other thing that's important to know is that link, which is your section of questions, can be shared with anybody you like. You remain the owner, but you can pass the survey to somebody else who can answer questions. You'd ask them, please, can you help with struggle with this? They will complete it. They will they will then provide the answers, which keeps working through, and eventually you will submit your section once it's completed. Very end of that. Copy and paste question. How many hours do employees spend on learning and development? This just gives you what an industry average is. So the um the the the, the digital companion can either answer questions all about ESG or, or or give you, you know, suggested answers to the questions in the survey itself. Right, anybody got a question? Just to prove that this is actually live. <laughs> anybody got a question they'd like to ask of our digital companion? Are you saying each department can answer submit individually or they don't have to wait and submit as a, a company submission? As it were? Uh, the way it works is that at the, at the bottom, if we can go through down to the bottom, Rob, just show the, the option buttons below. Close the companion. But you could do it. Yeah. And close the companion so you can see it easier. So this is what the bottom of that section looks like where you've got a reset, you've got a save draft, and you've got a submit. So uh, you can pass that to somebody, they can save the draft so they can see what you've done, they can see the answers, they can see where they need to uh, fill in the blanks, they can also then save draft, but it's always still owned by the person who was in that original five, the owner, so they still have that number. Uh, as I said, the progress bar will change. When somebody feels comfortable that they've answered all of the questions, they will submit. At that point, it goes in, it's weighted, it's scored, and it becomes part of what will come out as a report. Uh, the responses will also auto-save, but we've added a save draft button just because some people like to feel safe and click a button, but it's not necessary to click the button. Also, all the questions are mandatory, so you won't be able to submit until you answered all the questions, one way or the other. That's an important point. But each one of the five owners gets just gets questions specific to what they're over. Yes. So they don't get 200 and... No. no. They get their questions. Yes, yes and, correct. And is there is there a time limit once it's open for everyone to submit? Not not per question, but in terms of the whole... No, no, no time limit at this stage. We could put one on there, but I think it's up to the, the project lead who will then be watching the progress of those and eventually they'll, they'll chase and eventually they'll finish it. You know, it's, it's. Um, I always say it's it's uh, business critical, but not time critical, um, but it could well be because the buyer who may be asking for this to be done would like to get the reports from all of the uh, service providers that they're talking to. So you know, we're, we're keeping it relatively flexible at this stage, but some of those things we could add in there. Just, just to add, um, the individual owners will receive regular re reminders. Okay. Um, <coughs> questionnaire. Right. So we have we haven't decided whether those reminders will go up every week. We had it was it every week. I think yeah. we're looking yeah. at once a it week. It's every week, but we can always change it. Um, so until um, survey submitted, uh, you will keep getting reminders. Who is your typical customer for for this? Is it the procurement department of the buyer side, or is it the? It's the service provider who service the procurement the company, company, the procurement or the buy side is looking. So. Typically, with a lot of the companies we've talked to, they they will be looking at scoring for shortlist, for example, yeah. where ESG is 20% of the score, some up to 25%. So that's where it starts to get a bit tricky. It's like, well, we we also struggle with this, not only the people that have to answer the questions we have, which questions will we ask? So it's trying to standardize those things. So the so the customer, uh, the, the buy side could do the survey themselves uh, if they wish. Yeah. Anybody could do the survey, um, but it's typically for the process of understanding the service providers and their relative maturity uh, as part of that decision making or yeah. ongoing business. Okay. And mm -hmm. as sort of uh, frameworks develop around ESG, so EU is working on a framework, there's, there are other frameworks getting getting developed, so how, how will you? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. Uh, we were looking at something earlier in terms of some of the 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 uh, FCA who are looking at trying to standardize a lot of the responses and and some of the standards for those people running ratings. So you know we're very aware of those and working with my console who in their process and workflow tool have 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 the the system which manages responses, forecasts, plans attributable to every standard. 
Uh, but in this where we have a standard that's emerging where we need to have a question answered, then we will refer to that standard um, as we go through. Sure. I notice on the screen you've got a number of questions that are mandatory so, uh, with the with the asterisk. The additional information that you can add in and the, the, sub, the, the each subsequent question, how is that built into any form of weighting? Obviously, it's not mandatory. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. and, and, and that's a great question because what we look at is, I would think with the, the migration of this going forward and the, the direction it will take, it's much more of an honours based solution system. OK, so if you say that you've got, for example, a, a modern slavery uh, edict in the company and it's documented and it's board presented, then we looked at that and thought that, you know, we don't have a, a solution which is going through heavy audits or heavy certifications. What it does is allow you the opportunity to say you do have this document. You can describe where it is and what it is, or you can provide a link to it. So it's really up to you so that if you are doing this for the purpose of wanting to win business. I don't think you want to be going through this thing and putting in um, you know, untruths or exaggerations because you know, a buy side will say, you know, DEIMB, -E for example, is important. Um, we're really interested in something. So when they get the report, which comes back from the, uh, from the GSA, then they may want to question you know, each of their supply side on certain things that are important to them. Right now, over time, we may find that there is more requirement to provide certain mandatory things, and that'll come out of the interactions and the learnings of people as they go through this. Okay. So, if I'm understanding this correctly, a supplier could ask, get asked to fill this in for Meta RFP and, let's say, for a Zurich RFP. Does the system recognize that this is the same company that's already filled it in? Would you like to take that one, Kerry? I know the answer, but. So um, it's the service provider that actually will be filling it in and um, we will be looking at um, who we can make that information available to, um, but on, um, on request. So it's not going to be in a publicly published index. So if Meta wants that, we will ask the service providers that OK for us to actually give the report to Meta. If Zurich wants it, we will again say to the service provider, is that OK for us to give the full report? Yeah. Now, obviously, they'd be a bit ridiculous to say no. <laughs> That's the whole intention is that, you know, we become that central repository um, that um, gives the information to, 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 to all of the interested parties. It, it, but it's the same. Yeah, it can be, you know, complete once, use often. Yeah. So if you have, uh, if you are working as a service provider and you're asked by two or three different uh, buy sides to provide the SPSI, then You've already got it. You've already paid for it. It's yours to distribute to that uh, procurement group. Yeah, and when you as a service provider know that you're performing incredibly well compared to your peers, it's your marketing piece. You can use it as you want. You can take extracts from it. You can, you know, promote promote what what whatever aspects of it you want to promote. It's your report at the end of the day. Now, obviously, if you're not performing incredibly well, you may want to, um, you know, learn how to address your weaknesses and get improving quite quickly and then resubmit into the, the question as though your, your overall performance score um, Im, improves. How will the, sorry, and how will they know how many of their peers have filled it in? Do you say, you know, uh, 15 peers in your sector have filled this in and you're doing extremely well? How, how do they know that? Yeah, that's exactly what we'll be doing, yeah. So, um, and we will be using this to publish um, industry trends and highlights and observations as to how well our industry is performing across um, the ESG framework. So, yeah. Yeah, all that probably quarterly, you know, what Kerry will be producing is a, is a detailed benchmark report, what's happening with ESG in this sector, uh, where we're seeing trends, obviously over time it grows, we can see where things are changing, where things are moving. We can see across the ES and G and subcategories where there's weaknesses, where there's strengths, what those trends look like, so we're mapping those. So those things are all generated on the background data and then my console will be providing us with that, which go to Kerry to then publish. Right, sure. Sorry, wasn't my question. Oh, another question, sorry, you're going to get a couple from me. Um, so obviously, a service provider fills this in um, and it's submitted um, and they get a particularly poor score. Now, they can either elect to come back, they can fix the particular areas that they have a problem with, 
or they can leave it as, the, as they see fit. Does the system uh, come back on a, a periodic basis, an annual basis, and uh, ask them to recertify particular parts? And what's that sort of cadence? Yeah, I think our thinking is that it's it's kind of something you would want to be doing annually or may need to be doing annually. And, and we've looked at that and say there will be a 24, 2024 uh, SPSI because the modifications that we collect from both sides, the recommendations, the ideas, the improvements, the changes, because we're benchmarking, then we'd look at what does our 2024 benchmark look like as we move into the next year, then we will, on, on the advice of that ecosystem, make changes so that there will be a 2025 SPSI version, uh, which may have different influences in different areas. There are different standards, requirements, those sorts of things. So we've got to keep it relatively uh, comparable. So it's always about doing that. Um, we're also considering the opportunity that there is a cure period and there may be, you know, for an additional payment, you might be able to have a cure period where you feel once you get your report, it looks like you're pretty horrible in a few areas. Yeah, we may need to go and cure a few things and so that we can then represent in a period of time. But those are the sort of things that are the improvements that we're we're looking to build in as we go forward. Now, in case the sort of just a sure. question, um, in case the, the buyer sort of um, has different criteria, different scoring um, for for the benchmarking. Um, how how are we going to incorporate that in the tool? Yeah, I, I think there's always the opportunity to work the GSA to do something customized where you have a a unique question set. Yeah. Um, and use the tool to do that. I, I, we've never really talked about it, but it's not it's not really very difficult for us to then say let's let's support it for X Y Z. Um, let's let's build a customized set and let's score because they have a particular requirement or need or otherwise. Yeah, you know, what we've done is taken you know in input from a, a huge number of areas to produce what we believe is is the right comprehensive set of questions for this industry and for this sector. Yeah, and we have had that request from a couple of the buyers that, you know, we really want to focus on certain aspects of social. And yeah. um, we'll give them their report and then they can actually do their own calculations right. and, uh, and comparisons across their service providers to 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 reevaluate performance. And, and it's the same set of questions regardless of size of company and sector and everything else. Yes, it is. And the interesting thing is, you know, what you typically find is there is such a combination between group and regional and and in country, for example, um, and what you find is a lot of the a lot of the materials, the questions are answered always because the group have a, a group initiative in terms of what they're doing, their standards. But you also then have the local requirements. You have the local environmental issues. So what the way I see it is typically, you know, where a company is providing a, an annual global sustainability report, right, it doesn't usually impact the by region where you're working. So if you are, for example, looking at services in EMEA, you're not really that bothered what the group standards look like for global. You want something a little bit more specific for the area that you are acquiring inside of. And the, that information is captured, sorry, right at the very beginning. So the, the onboarding form really looks at what's the size of the um, organization in terms of employee, employees and financial turnover, but then also well, what um, what region uh, and what scope are you responding to this questionnaire in? Are you going at group level? Are you going at, at site level? So you may have multiple <laughs> surveys from that business in, in certain areas. I have two questions. Uh, the first is, is it possible for the data to be retained? So if you're being asked to recertify, you're not having to input questions from scratch because there's over 200, mm -hmm. uh, which is the first question. My answer there would be yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Second question being, there are different parts of the E, the S, or the G that you won't be able to demonstrate impact a year later. So, who determines that the sort the recertification is that down to the buyer, or how does that that work? So, for example, volunteering, you can implement a volunteering program, and you can say um, in twenty twenty four, this is what we've done. Uh, in twenty twenty five, this is the impact. However, if you are looking at your supply chain, for example, and you're looking at your emissions, 
that's not a year, that's about two years. So who makes that call? Um, I probably need to give us take a step back and explain how my console works then in that case, if that's okay with you. If it's very quick, if it, not, maybe it is, we put this one to, yeah. Okay, so what it is, what we're trying to do now is set up a maturity assessment. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, but then if you look at my console as a platform, it's a workflow based ESG management platform. That's what it does. And what we're using here is a certain part of that platform. What the platform allows you to do is, you know, do your materiality, maturity, your baselining, your benchmarking, you set up your sustainability initiatives, manage those, set up KPIs, track, all of that. So that's a comprehensive sort of ESG management process. Now, to answer your question, let's say you come on board and you do the assessment this time, and you realize that there are a number of initiatives that you need to start. And you do start with initiatives, and now you want to take a snash, snapshot of where you are. You really need to come into the platform as a platform sort of user uh, to be able to manage that, because you are now moving out of the maturity assessment, getting into the ESG management part of it, or sustainability initiatives management part of it. But at the end of the day, the, the question set that you get when you do the, the next assessment will be reflected in the question and will be reflected on the, the current basis. If there hasn't been a change, then you're still scoring it the same as it was in the previous iteration. So the responsibility is split. So as a supplier, my ma the management of it, which would, would be my responsibility, but the assessment of my management is for the buyer to do with what they will in terms of the information they receive. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, Gary. So um, we have been fortunate enough to actually have a customer work with us very, very closely on the development of the the, the questionnaire and and review it and and go through the beta. So um, so this is a lovely quote from um, Dan Lang, um, who's a SVP at Sutherland. Um, I don't need to read it to you, but um, yeah, we we have got. Um, you probably want to explain a little bit more about the process you went been through with um, with Sutherland, but um... yeah, Sutherland have been involved in in providing uh, responses to uh, many buy sides. It's a it's a large organization. It's a large global business process outsource, uh, very much in back office and front office services. Um, they uh, they have been involved in any, if not all, of the the major platforms for um, for the assessments. And so they're very excited about something that comes from within their sector that is much more appropriate to their sector. And being a pioneer partner, you know, we've taken a lot of counsel on the things that they've found as frustrations and, and issues when they've been filling out previous surveys. And what they're what they're getting now is something that they feel is is something they can take a much greater ownership for. So we're incredibly grateful to Sutherland for the time and effort they've actually spent working with us, helping us fine tune this. And we will continue to to, to make adaptions um, as we see fit through that journey. So. Right, so um, just very, very briefly, I mean, this is just the very beginning. I mean, the vision for what we're trying to achieve here is a really big global movement. So um, we haven't formally launched it, um, but it is a, a work very well in progress. So I'll uh, be working with our friends in the United States, the uh, IAOP, um, Debbie Hamill, the chief exec there, where we meet every week to discuss how we can actually um, develop um, standards and, and programs of change for the industry. So we both as industry associations um, represent the interests of the buyers and the service providers and bring all sides of the sourcing um, ecosystem together. We've um, been working really closely now for about three years. The standards that we've already had in place, the qualifications that we've already had in place are very, very similar. We're very, very like-minded organisations, but IOP really represents the buyers um, from the US and GSA obviously represents much more the buyers from UK and, and also Europe. Um, so we're looking at how we can create a, a joint venture to merge our best practices uh, and we're doing that in the back end but at the same at the front end we're really looking at developing new best practices for um, sustainable sourcing so new more modern approaches to agile sourcing and to more, more sustainable sourcing practices. So what we have been working on, and I have um, um, shared this before, but we're really excited about it, is uh, a new body called Formiga. 
Um, the reason why it's called Formiga is that um, in, historically, in, in a previous life, um, I, I ran a PR company called Buffalo. And it was called Buffalo because at the time, market research said people remembered the names of animals more than anything else. So we thought we'd apply this to this new joint venture. So, um, so yes, we used um, chat GPT to say what animal most closely resembles the global technology business services industry. And the response was the ant most resembles the global technology and business services industry because it's really um, agile, very flexible, very strong, really collaborative. And um, it's, it, it evolves and changes just like the global technology and business services industry. Well, ant didn't sound like a very good name, was a very um, appealing. Um, so we then went and put ant into Google Translate and uh, cut a long story short. Um, it came up with, we thought Spanish, because we do a lot of work with um, Latin America. Um, Spanish for ant was Omega, um, but Portuguese for ant is Formiga. And because we're developing and forming the industry for good alliance. Formiga was like, yeah, that's absolutely perfect. You know, so we um, are in the throes of creating a joint venture that's looking at developing loads of different new best practices for sustainable sourcing and really positioning our industry as an industry for good. So um, the website will be launched soon and it is an industryforgood.com and is really, really focused on how the global technology and business services industry is performing um, 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 uh, you know, across the sustainable ESG agenda. So we're working and discussing, you know, new standards such as a new global impact sourcing standard and, and different programmes like that, which will then come into this questionnaire. So there will be a question, are you accredited for, for MEGA for this, that and the other? And obviously you will get more points in your ESG report when you are accredited to different um, activities for Formiga. Really, really just focused on globally um, developing our industry and positioning our industry as an industry for good by sharing good um, social and sustainable best practices. And it's going to be both a global assessment and accreditation body. So we're working collaboratively globally to define the new best practices when we will then um, globally collaboratively assess audit advise and then a credit to those new best practices. Right, so the aspiration is huge. The aspiration is that we do actually have um, a, a repository of the performance of every technology and business service provider around the world and how well they're performing on every site and every location. We've been speaking to ADEC about the work that they've done for other industry associations. I don't know if you want to share very briefly one of your case studies that can actually help picture what this might actually end up looking like. Yeah, I'll try and do it briefly. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so at ADEC, we're both a uh, service provider, but we're also ESG, you know, professionals, sustainability specialists. So this is sort of right square centre of, of, of work where our interest. Uh, and we think it's a great initiative. So congratulations on on everything. It's uh, really exciting. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it made us think about some of the things that, that Ada could have done. So uh, people at the symposium would have heard us talk about it. There's a coalition of most of the big apparel companies called ZDHC, which is zero discharge harmful chemicals, which is, that's, <laughs> says, says, does what it says in the tin. Uh, it's basically formed to take harmful chemicals out of the waterways in countries where you know, Levi's jeans, Nike trainers, uh, Ralph Lauren uh, clothing is, is manufactured. Um, so the coalition recognised, and this is probably going back 10 years, but it's still active now, they needed a, a program that needed to include some technology to help with, with driving this, with data exchange, BI and tracking um, uh, different manufacturers and sites uh, compliance with this standard. So, uh, and, and that's been very, very successful. Uh, so when we look at, with our knowledge of the service provider industry and ESG and experience with the apparel industry, when we look at what you guys are doing here there's a lot of parallels so um with service providers same to this standardized way of 
being able to see the ESG performance, we think there's opportunities to do similar things to what the apparel industry have done, which um, and there's some exciting opportunities. So we spoke about it at the symposium and we did this kind of video for the like a demo video for the Northeast Sourcing Summit that a few of us uh journeyed up to um so maybe we'll share that with people because it's the easiest way to explain it we can put it on the gsa linkedin or something so people can see that tangible example thank you that's quick enough yeah no that's brilliant right so uh, i mean we're really excited about what we've developed it has as you say taken a long time um lots of people have been involved and we're incredibly appreciative um of that but um yeah we'd love to get some feedback so i don't know if there's any questions comments observations either from um the online community or any additional comments in the room um does everybody just want to go for a drink <laughs> <laughs> that's john's yeah he's gone he's out <laughs> um any questions our feedback um, I think it's great to have the digital companion because there will be different suppliers who don't know the definitions of the questions that's being asked this was very helpful to come to supplement their learning so they can answer the question thoroughly even they have over 200 to answer so it cuts a lot of back and forth for them to be able to do that so that touch is very um very helpful in terms of the feedback I did have one final question though. yeah please do yeah. what is the cost you mentioned the cost a couple of times Yes, yes, there are two fees. There's a subsidised fee for members of the GSA and there's a different fee for non-members. Correct me if I'm wrong, Alistair, but I think it's £2,200 for non-members um, and £1,850 for members of the GSA. So for that fee, you do get, obviously, all of the questions um, you know, all of the, the points within my console, you know how far you've gone, what you need to do, etc. Um, and obviously the digital companion is included within that. What is not included within that is if you actually need to use my console as a, uh, as a management tool to help improve your ESG performance. And will you charge the buy side as well or is it only the sell side that's going to get uh... That's going to be down to each partnership, to be quite honest. So we do know that some of the buyers are willing to um, help contribute towards it. Some of the buyers are willing to pay for the whole thing because it's going to be a mandate from them to actually fill it in. Other cases, it will be um, the service providers that, you know, that will willingly fund it themselves. So it really depends on each, each partnership um, as to who will pay for it. Do you have already a body of organizations that have gone through the process registered in the system no we are we've we've beta trialed it with these organizations we've got an ESG advisory panel of buyers and um, they've gone through the process with us and uh, have, have helped us find you the questions and the weighting of those questions um, and then Sutherland has been the um the pioneer partner that has actually gone through it from a service provider perspective but uh yeah we're, we're ready for the fuck it's open and um yeah the, the assessments have been done on the my console platform for several years so this is a gsa iteration it's already a mature uh, assessment platform the question i'm a bit of a novice but um when you talk about the uh relative ratings of the input how how is that going to be how's it going to manifest itself i mean how are you comparing a a good performing supplier with a bad performing or an excellent one what is what is it what is it what does it manifest itself as is there a, is there a numerical rating and how do you come up with that yeah it's 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 a good question because it, it requires i think taking a lot of the experience from the overall ecosystem network inputs so from selecting which questions you would include which were important and going through that process first of all then there's a process of going through and applying scoring against each of those points so two points one point zero points depending on what they are but then understanding that some questions have greater relevance than others then there are more points for that question versus others so some of them are in the you know rather than being a, a one point answer it's a two point answer so it's it's relatively subjective, but it's it's something that has gone through the mill in terms of 
the, what are the questions, what are the point scores, and what are the weightings of those things that are more important than others, and then that that all combines to a, a score which is then because you have different numbers of questions in each, it's not just 60% of the number of questions, but the scores are reflected so that the score represents in the end 60%, 20%, 20%. Yeah, can I just add to that? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure if you have that slide. So when you get the report, you get a dashboard um, and there are four different sort of dials on the dashboard. One uh, shows you an overall performance um, and Another one showing your performance on E and performance on S and performance on G. So E, for example, you scored 60%, S, you scored 80%, and G, 90%. As well as overall, you perform 67%, for example. So that kind of gives you a headline sort of figure. Um, is, that, is that relative to the people who submitted their entries, or is it relative to that and the marketplace? So, for instance, when you, when you start off, presumably, there'll be one supplier's entry, they'll be brilliant. If it's comparative to each other, when you get 100, it starts to become a meaningful statistic. And, uh, so that's what I was sort of trying to get at work out. Is how do you balance that as, as, as the use of this grows? You suddenly get a more statistically viable set of information and know where you are in the marketplace. Yeah, that's the um, that's the intent yeah. is um, obviously it's going to start off with a um, few companies being in it and just knowing their overall score. But until we've actually got a lot of data yeah. in there, it'll be difficult to sort of, um, you know, just saying who's performing really well and where they perform really well. And we operate as an ongoing panel who are looking at those and reviewing them. And as we go through to the next uh, version, which might be a 2025 version, then there will be feedback from all areas and, and lessons learned and feedback from the buy side, the sell side, right? Yeah. First step always is how are you performing in absolute terms? Yeah, okay. That's the first yeah. step. Thanks. I mean, the intention is that this is going to be a huge time saver for the industry. You know, the number of people that are actually having to spend hours, days, months filling in different ESG questionnaires and just on repeat because every question is different. So, you know, the, the time saving for service providers for doing this, but then the the, the reassurance for the buyers, knowing that their service providers, um, are how well they're performing, and there will be the data that says how well they're performing against the rest of the industry, you know, is, is, is it's going to be hugely, um, hugely valuable. Yeah. So. Any, any anything that I missed out or we've missed out that we think is really pertinent to share? Uh, no, uh, I think people, I expected people to have questions around the questions and, you know, what if, how do I know what that question means, etc. Uh, and you kind of touched upon it. The two ways you can do it, one is there is a tool tip. So if you just sort of, you know, hover over it, it tells you what the question is saying, what the question is asking. But if you still don't understand, there's a copy button. You click on that and literally paste it in the bot. Uh, that you saw, uh, so you get sort of more information about it. And beyond that, there is help of it. Uh, so if you still, you know, need to ask questions about those questions, you can always send an email to a particular email address and, and get to know. Uh, yeah, there's all the support you need uh, for this, and we've been working with Sutherland uh, in terms of this version and the help that they've required. And they've, they've given some really good ideas on things that they felt were shortcomings in other uh, other survey tools, and uh, we've incorporated those in this version. So it's been good. There's a question. Is there a question? I just saw something. I was just asking if, the, if anybody's got any questions. Ah. <laughs> oh, it's your question. It's me rallying the. I just something I'd add, um, having been part of the kind of process to, to some degree, is you know, we've kind of focused on, and this discussion is focused on the service provider buyer relationship, which I think is because that's the focus of. Of the, of the of the assessment and that's where a lot of the heavy lifting comes as somebody that sells to end users you know they want to assess your ESG performance but actually my experience in the last few months has been it actually extends beyond that so we've been asked by our investor for example to do quarterly reporting on ESG performance we've been asked by the British Standards Authority as part of our secure infosec assessment to do ESG reporting so actually this is creeping into all aspects of of business relationships and partnerships, not just selling to a customer that wants to assess your performance relative. So I think it's going to have value you know, to be on that media buyer service provider relationship as well. Yeah, I think as a you know as a many years service provider, um, 
something like this is is a little bit of an annoyance and it's it's about you know working with the association is to try to get people to understand that this is a competitive weapon this is something that will help you win business by increasing your corporate social responsibility being able to demonstrate your corporate social responsibility through ESG and through through the reports uh, but it also means the same as Terry said that you will be as a business hit up from all sorts of angles to answer questions about things from different standards and different angles. This isn't going to be the only thing that's going to be something. But once you've been through this process, which is why we wanted to make it thorough enough, as a business, as a service provider, you should be much better equipped then to answer the next thing because you've already been through the process. It's there, it's documented. It becomes part of the culture as you go forward. So the next step is for this, you know, the first step is to understand where you are, what is your maturity, you get your benchmarking, where am I versus the rest, which means what are, what are my competitive pressures likely to be? Because, you know, I do know of, of competitors who have fallen out of the race because their ESG score is so low. So it's a matter of picking that up. Then it's about saying, let's do something about it. Um, we can then offer on the back of this, then we could start looking at doing some detailed recommendations from experts and start to dig deeper into what you should be doing about it over the next you know, two, three, five years, um, and then implementing what will be standard for any business, which is the, the workflow and process, just like a financial system or a CRM. It's, it's, it's will be a tool which is required in every business. So it is a journey. And that's that's what GSA are wanting to do is to try to be uh, help guide both the service provider side and the buyer side. So you know everyone is is winning. How long does it last, Alice? So you've completed the survey and it's gone to GSA, etc. Does it need to be updated annually or? Yeah, the the view is currently that it's annual, and the view is that you know working with the panel, we would see that the modifications, changes, upgrades, better ideas, new ways of doing things. Probably my thinking at the moment, I don't think we've thought through this fully yet, but it's likely to be an annual uh, service. If you've got a service, a, a buyer who says, well, you've done your SPSI, but I see it was eight months ago, we'd like you to do another one or an updated one, then that that's also the choice. But generally, we'd probably want to see an annual uh, upgradation of the platform based on the feedback from, and, and let's face it, this is for the industry, by the industry. So it's taking counsel from all the peers in that industry. And then when Formiga develops new standards, for example, you know, you might want to sort of say, actually, my, my marks would have changed significantly yeah. but now accredited to a different, you know, sustainable sourcing standard. Um, so you couldn't volunteer, you know, put yourself forward to, to, to resubmit. This is going to be like a, a site level uh, survey, site level ass assessment, a maturity assessment, I suppose, which is, as you pointed out, quite important. But uh, just thinking through, you may have already thought of this, probably have. A, a lot of the service providers who are going to be completing this, working with those bigger organisations that need this in RFP, they're going to have multiple sites. And some of the things are going to be, you know, need to be done. Everything needs to be reported individually, right? But a lot of that is going to be policies, corporate policies, and all those sort of things are going to be consistent. So I wonder whether there's an opportunity like, would you have to do the whole thing again for each site you had, or is there maybe an opportunity to, I don't know, do some sort of, it's likely haste for certain elements. And it's likely would need to. So from my world or my past world in terms of, you know, the BPO world, for example, if there's a lot of interest in buying South Africa for the delivery of English language service, for example, then the environmental conditions are quite different from anywhere else. So therefore the E part will change a lot. Uh, also, some of the factors that you have uh, locally in, in social sustainability as well are different. So you would likely find that you're going to have to do, you know, whatever is being demanded by the buy side for you. So you know, probably at country level, mostly, uh, pro probably not at site level, but certainly at country level. But if I'm doing like a multi-site proposal for uh, Meta, do I get a discount from from my uh, <laughs> second <laughs> site? <laughs> Do I need to put on there? It's above my pay grade. I <laughs> to talk to Kerry about that. That's an overdrinks yeah. conversation. <laughs> Are we doing anything to to validate the data? And yeah, and that's a great question because as we went before, it's 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 more like an honors based service because the the level that you would need to go to to audit, to certify, and validate, and to store, you know, those sorts of things are and can be quite immense. So. We're talking about 
a relationship, a symbiotic relationship between the buy side and the sell side. So if you are a, a supplier, you need to be making sure that whatever you are stating as your position is the position you have. And uh, as I said before, the you know the buyer can question any element of this to find out if that's relevant. Things that are really important, I and mean, you you don't want to be really be caught out with yeah. one, the, the great term greenwashing, right? So you want to make sure that you're putting you know what is the actual situation forward. Um, would we eventually move to a situation? There may be elements that that could require certification. I mean, we may think in in our industry, impact sourcing is really important. So there could be elements where we would ask of that certain elements of certification. But again, that comes from the ecosystem that is advising what's important, what's critical, um, and what should we do to modify, change, and grow. Yeah, I think some of the uh, some of the sellers who are quite large and publicly listed sellers, yeah. um, you have a certain degree of ESG information out there as part of their reporting, their public reporting anyways. Um, so, I mean, I think they're, I'm just, Making a comment here, that, you know, there's a there's an opportunity probably to look at growing the tool to capture that information, which is out there in the public yeah. domain, and kind of have either a comparison or kind of you know use that as a basis. Yeah, and it's it's difficult if you are a supplier and you want a level playing field. Yeah, if you are paying huge amounts of, of money for sophisticated platforms of massive IT teams to do, you know, the, the API data feeds on everything, that's great. But if you're a smaller company, you don't have the resources, but you may be much better and stronger in other areas, boy, you may score. So it's just trying to make sure that- But that's why GSA can come into picture to make the playing field level. And that's what the bench benchmarking and the support that GSA can provide and actually, I'm just thinking that, you know, I mean, there can be a solid consulting practice on the back of it to actually help yeah. bring that level playing field up. Yeah. You're right. I'm happy to volunteer for that if you... Uh, yeah, we've got a volunteer right here for that service. Well, that absolutely is the intention. Yeah, the intention is to improve the industry and to put the industry at the avant-garde of the ESG agenda by better sharing, sharing or better performance. So... um. Cool. So, so I've got another question. So, a lot of the presentation was around the supply side, the service break. What would I see from a from a buy side? So, do I come to the GSA and go? I'm. Do you provide me with a smorgasbord of suppliers that have been through the process? I'm interested in um, uh, financial outsourcing, for example. And I come to you and go. I need a list of suppliers. Will you provide me with that list? To, uh, well, does it work from a from a from a John Lewis side, for example? Very good question. We would love that. Yes, absolutely. But we did we've made it very clear that we don't want this to be a name and shame index. So we're not going to be publishing a list um, of the top one hundred, you know, one to one hundred performers. Yeah. But if you were um, actively about to engage in the market and you really wanted to understand the performance of the the service providers, we would be giving you access to the scores of the different service providers and their reports. Oh, yes, it's obviously the financial, uh, the cost of the service that is, they are providing is only one part of uh, the whole choice and uh, selection process. Yeah, that's typically, you know, it's, a, it's, it's sort of sitting around 20%, some are going to 25% on ESG. And I think if the, the buy side is a member of GSA, then that's something they're aware of and they know the tool exists. Uh, and they then basically it's it's their responsibility through the GSA to say, you know, and ask of those suppliers if they would complete this. Okay. Just add to that, sort of, expanding the user rather than added benefit. If you are a company um, that does the maturity assessment and there are certain areas that you fare poorly, for example, it is possible for us to convert those areas into specific actions that you can then you know, manage thereafter. Um, that's, that's obviously an extension of the maturity assessment, but that's possible. So you don't then have to look at the report and say, okay, so these are 20 areas where we need to do something and then what do I do? It is possible for us to sort of automatically convert those weaker areas or poor responses into 
Um, yeah, it's a pinch of nipples. Yeah, so it's just one of those things though, why we selected the way we do things is it's not you do an assessment, that's it, full stop. Right. We've got a we've got an ability to to take a business on a journey and help them with that. So it's good. Drinks time, Kerry. Yep. Everybody, well, we can carry on this conversation um, over drinks. So um, everybody online, um, sorry you can't join us for drinks, but thank you very much for joining us for this um, for this conversation. Please do get in touch with the GSA if you've got any queries. There is now one hand up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is that your hand? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Hold on a minute. That was Adrian's hand. Adrian. Adrian Quail, yes. Very hi. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yes. you, Adrian. Brilliant. Yeah, no, um, so many thanks. Yeah, very interesting initiative. Um, obviously, really pleased to to hear that you're really collaborating well with Debbie. I'm so pleased about that. <laughs> um, I suppose the main question I've got is uh, to what extent have you uh, taken on board um, some of the other standards that are out there? Uh, I, I'm sort of conscious that this is probably the first overarching um, um, sort of standards uh, in in uh, in in existence but I, I know that there are piecemeal standards obviously ISO 1401 1401 <laughs> uh, actually looks at uh, sustainability and the environment to what extent have you taken on board what's in those other standards that are out there in the marketplace yeah it's a matter of the, the work we've done to assemble the questions to uh, point those questions in the direction of the relevant standards. Um, and, you know, those standards and the requests of, of where you're at are, are part of the question set. Uh, as we go forward, those standards will change. Um, we're aware of them and they're also, you know, there are, we've referred to the standards inside of the question set for the different regions, for the European standards or the US standards, for example, what's an SEC standard or different standards for Europe, for the UK, for the USA. So a good question. And yes, they have been reflected in the survey and over time they will be added to and changed with the, the movement of the market. Can I just add to that? Just one. So in addition to the specific input from buyers, we have looked at the available frameworks and standards um, in the sustainability world, i.e. the GRI, the SASPs, the ISSPs at the time, anything that was available uh, and, and pull the relevance out of those standards for the tech and business service industry. Um, and, and you see that there is a sort of compliance at various levels with various standards. Um, thing is, at the moment, the industry is not regulated from a sustainability sort of framework or standards point of view. Uh, um, so hence, we've had to sort of go across standards and you know, pull relevant areas and sections together and create questions out of those. Yeah. Question, Adrian, though, thank you very much for asking it. Any other questions before we wrap up and go for a drink? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank, thank you, you all. to RPC for hosting us. Really do appreciate um, you hosting us and for the drinks that you're now going to offer us. Thank Excellent. you. <laughs> <laughs> Off.